Section 15 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Financial Records of the Reign of King John by Hilary Jenkinson, FSA. The most superficial study makes it clear that finance played a part of extreme importance in the reign of King John. It is probably not too much to say, considering any of the great crises of his time, that had he commanded even adequate financial resources, the other elements in the situation, the personal character of himself and those with whom he came in contact at home and abroad, political influences, national movements, would have worked out to a quite different end. His period, too, after long neglect, has in recent years received considerable attention. It is strange, therefore, that the existing records, which may be either directly ascribed to, or obviously associated with, his financial administration, have been to a great extent left aside by historians. It is true that the primary executive instrument of his time was the chancery, and that chancery records have nearly all been published for his reign, with introductions which, in some cases at least, still stand but even the chancery records are comparatively unworked for the financial points, at any rate for the smaller ones, which they contain, partly, no doubt, because, it is the great lack of all the earlier record publications, they have no subject index. The direct records of exchequer administration have, with two exceptions, been left severely alone. Here again, there is an obvious reason in an obvious difficulty. The pipe rolls, the chief, though not the only, class of direct exchequer records for this reign, being so bulky that inquirers have doubtless despaired of making a just use of them. It would be well if these records could be dealt with in print. Meanwhile, the present anniversary seems to offer an opportunity for the survey of such exchequer records of King John as remain to us. Having surveyed, we may also do good work by endeavouring to place them. We have a good general summary of exchequer procedure as it was in the twelfth century, in the Dialogus de Sacario, and we know, in outline at least, what the machinery of it was in the period which first gives us fairly complete manuscript remains of the various departments of exchequer administration, say the early fourteenth century. It is obvious that the second of these states has grown out of the first, but obvious also that we cannot, without investigation, put down to mere expansion all the changes which we find. There might well have been some violent innovation. Now where do John's exchequer records stand in relation to this expansion and, if they took place, to these innovations? The fact that the chancery rolls begin with his reign makes it peculiarly desirable to establish at this point some limit between the twelfth and fourteenth centuries in the matter also of the exchequer. Even so, we have not exhausted the list of what may properly be considered preliminaries essential to the study by historians of John's finances. All administrations, perhaps everywhere, certainly in England, have been from the earliest date subject to the mysterious influence of the legal fiction. Old forms, that is to say, because they were established and because they had legal sanction, have been adapted to violently new uses. Two people play at going to law in order to transfer land with the greater security. The king makes out a receipt for money he has not received from A, in order to have a convenient substitute for cash with which himself to pay B. We have in fact to consider the records of, for example, the annual audit in the light of transactions which we know from other sources to have taken place, in order to settle the question whether the pipe roll at a given period represents what we should expect it to represent a survey of the year's income, or whether it is only partially this, or not this at all. Reversing the process we have to test, where possible, our knowledge of the alleged exaction of the king by its representation in records. Does the statement that the king imposed a talliage of 20,000 marks mean that he obtained 20,000 marks? In the vast majority of cases, administrative documents and narrative descriptions have not both survived for any given transaction in early medieval times, but an examination of the cases where they have will furnish a criterion of value for the large number of cases where only one or the other remains to us. To deal with such problems as this is obviously beyond the scope of a single paper, 
indeed for the most part they must be left till greater facilities in the way of printed and indexed records are available at the same time in view of the wide and unquestioning use which has been made of chronicle statements the point is worth raising meanwhile we may attempt perhaps with some profit the survey of the wealth which remains to us and to a certain extent the classification of the records from the point of view of the part they played in the administration of the various departments. For the purposes of a survey it will be convenient to travel backwards. Briefly then to summarize what is well known, the financial documents which remain to us from the time when the course of the Exchequer was well established, say at the end of the first quarter of the fourteenth century, are as follows it may be premised that we are attempting only to deal with those officials who left us records i e direct records of the particular processes they controlled for example we are to display an interest in the chamberlains of the receipt but not in the tellers important as the latter ultimately became to begin with the exchequer of audit this is represented by the two departments of the king's remembrancer and the lord treasurer's remembrancer the latter's department is that of final audit represented in records by the pipe roll and the divisions which split off from it the king's remembrancer's department that of preliminary audit is represented in records by a mass of vouchers of every shade of variety in point of officiality provenance and writing and by some preliminary statements or summaries of accounts compotuses compiled from the vouchers these last are closely connected with the enrolled accounts mentioned above all these are an origin part of the ancient miscellanea of the exchequer k r and are represented now by a number of classes principally those known collectively as exchequer accounts the supplementary interim or domestic affairs of the upper exchequer as a whole the proceedings of the barons their minutes and correspondence are represented in the case of both these remembrancers by a memoranda roll in which each of them had noted such of the proceedings as interested his department. In many cases the same information would appear in both roles. These memoranda are, of course, the distinctive records of remembrancers. At the time we are speaking of they are arrayed in definite divisions, including the Adventus Vicae Comitium and Dies Date, showing the arrangements made for audit, the Brevia Directa Baronibus, a section of in-letters, the status et visus compotorum, the brevia retornabilia and irretornabilia, outletters, the precepta, instructions for issue of writs of process, and a section in which private deeds are enrolled, and, most important of all, the very lengthy communia, with various subsections, the chief of which is that of the recorda of revenue cases, which come up for decision before the barons. This last section is intimately connected with the origin of the separate exchequer of pleas, but precisely how intimately has not yet been settled. Behind or below this exchequer of audit, separate from but subject to it, is the department of receipt, represented qua officials by the treasurer and the two chamberlains or their deputies. Speaking broadly, the duties of these three at the recepta are the same and they are represented in records by either a common collection or a triplicate series. They record the operation of receipt by preserving counterfoils of receipts. The foils of tallies are contra tally, and eventually the stocks of the same when these come in after audit, and copies of the inscriptions of these tallies on rolls, receipt rolls. The operation of issue by preserving the original writs for issue, copies of these liberate rolls, or notes of them, issue rolls. Besides the recepta, there is another office where receipt and issue go on. When the differentiation of the exchequer from the curia was complete, the result was the elimination of any personal control by the monarch. The same thing occurred in the departmentalization of the chancellor, who, with his staff, controlled the great seal. In each case the result was the same. Under the older official, or rather body of officials, there grew up an official or an office closely resembling it in functions, and to some extent in methods, but controlled, as itself had originally been, directly by the sovereign. At its weakest, the new body acted as a link between the older one and the king, 
at its strongest it usurped in his behalf the authority of its prototype the departmentalization of the curia in fact brought into existence the camera the household grew up as an administrative organ beneath the court thus below the process of the great seal preliminary or subsidiary to it we have that of the privy seal and presently below this in its turn the signet similarly below the exchequer upper and lower auditing body and receipt we have financial functionaries of a less official character notably we have well established long before the fourteenth century the wardrobe taking upon itself to a greater or less extent according to the relative strength of the king and ministers for the time being the function of receiving and more particularly of spending the king's money of the activities of the officials of the wardrobe record is preserved to us in the shape of a regular series of accounts with quantities of attendant vouchers among the records of the king's remembrancer apart from the direct operations thus recorded at the two departments of the upper exchequer at the receipt and at the wardrobe record is preserved at the chancery of the part played by that executive in originating active financial operations writs for issues and those concerned with the audit process writs of account allowance pardon etc are preserved in copies made as they issue from the chancery we have in particular the chancery liberate rolls because these many other letters under the great seal must necessarily concern the exchequer either directly by causing payments in or out or indirectly by modifying the property in respect of which audit takes place as these letters unlike the writs mentioned above are not directed to exchequer officials copies or notes of them extracted from the chancery enrolments must be sent over to the exchequer where they are preserved in the shape of originalia or chancery estreats finally we must give a word in passing to another class of non exchequer records the rolls of the justices full of subjects so interesting to the exchequer as amercements as these were preserved at the treasury of the exchequer they were presumably available there for reference but as streets were also prepared from them whether by the justices or the exchequer officials for the information of the exchequer and its accounting officers it is to be noted that all the operations which lie at the base of the classes of documents we have touched on are simple ones which in a primitive form at least are going on in the earliest times at which we have detail of the organized finance of the king's courts to return now to these earliest times in the time of the dialogus we have an upper exchequer represented in records by the pipe roll the form of which a fact confirmed by existing rolls is essentially the same as that we find later it is written we are told by the treasurer's scribe from his dictation at the actual time of audit and at the same time a copy was taken by the chancellor's scribe for the chancellor we may add for completeness a reference to the existing rolls and their publications by the pipe roll society there is evidence of the production of original writs of pardon or allowance at audit time by the accountant and of their preservation by the marshal at the recepta the officials are the same as we find there later the tallies given out as acknowledgments of sums paid in are also practically the same and the foils and subsequently the stocks are preserved in like manner the writing on them is done by the treasurer's clerk the same official also deputat scripto the sums received possibly this is a reference to the rotulo receptorum which is also mentioned payment out is already dependent on a writ of liberate from the chancery which the officials of the receipt preserve after it has been honoured two examples of the henry the second period have survived before going any further we may interpolate here some remarks about the separate financial administration of normandy an administration which of course was not in existence so far as concerns this country at the later date we have been discussing stapleton who edited the rolls of this norman exchequer for the society of antiquaries quoting allusions made in the dialogus to this scaccarium transmarinum discredits the suggestion that the english system was based on the norman a position taken also by most modern writers but makes it clear that there was a separate norman thesaurus in eleven thirty one and the balance of opinion seems to be in favour of accepting the fact of a scaccarium 
in session in Normandy as early as 1171. It is to be noted that the Dialogus expressly describes this overseas exchequer as essentially different from the English one, and Professor Powicki in describing its functions is, of course, noting some functions and fashions which are certainly not English. The surviving rolls go back to 1184. It is further to be noted that in the time of the Dialogus we have already allusions to financial transactions carried on by some machinery other than that of the Scacorium and Recepta, by the Camera, in fact, both in England and in Normandy. In the Chancery, it appears from the Dialogus, the Chancellor's clerk keeps a rescriptum, otherwise called contra brevia, of the writs of liberate, pardon, and allowance issued, and these contra brevia may apparently be produced at the Exchequer Board of Audit, just as the contralati are produced for checking purposes by the officials of the receipt. Turning to judicial records, we find that the Dialogus supplies no evidence of the existence of plea rolls in its time, the earliest which have survived, are of the reign of Richard I. But it is clear that information concerning immersements imposed is furnished by the justices. Now it will be noticed, as one compares the 12th with the 14th century, that we have here certain large gaps. At the receipt we have seen nothing of any issue or liberate rule. In the chancery there is no preparation of originalia, though the rescriptum or contra brevia seem to be used for the same purpose. Finally, we have said nothing, so far, in relation to the twelfth century, of the remembrancers and of their most distinctive records, the memoranda. I have mentioned these last because we have here a matter which needs rather more detailed discussion. It is clear, of course, that in the time of the Dialogus, the business of audit was not divided up into the preliminary and final department of the King's Remembrancer and the Lord Treasurer's Remembrancer, or any two officials under other names. But that does not mean necessarily that there were not at that date Remembrancers, or at any rate some officials whose successors ultimately became Remembrancers. Moreover, we have yet to mention two more officers whom the Dialogus does chronicle, with their records, Master Thomas Brown and the Archdeacon of Poitou, Richard of Ilchester, for a short time Seneschal of Normandy. These being two and unplaced in the exchequer scheme of things, and the later remembrancers, who are not mentioned in the Dialogus, being also two, it is naturally tempting to equate the pairs. Thus Dr. Poole has long been accustomed to see, in Thomas Brown and Richard of Ilchester, the origin of the two remembrancers who first appear by name under Henry the Third. The position of both at the Exchequer Board is certainly anomalous. Of Thomas Brown we are told that at the court of the Sicilian king, before he came over to that of Henry the Second, he was in regis secretis pena prasapuis, and that at the English Exchequer he sits in quarto scano quod est oppositum justicario and that he has a copy made from the pipe roll, or parts of it, at the same time as the Chancellor's clerk makes the Chancellor's counter roll, his own clerk having a special seat given him that he may be able to discharge this duty, that he also has a clerk at the receipt who, liberum habet facultatum scribendi, cue recipientur et expendentur. Of the archdeacon we are told that his clerk kept rescripta of the writs of summons which he used for the purpose of checking them when they were read out at the audit. We are also given details of his place at the board. As to the peculiarity of the position of these two administrators, Thomas Brown's privilege of keeping for his own use a third role is praetor antiquium, consuetudinum, while the archdeacon's position is ex officio quidem set ex novella constitutione, in the case of this last passage, a variant reading would tell us that he sits non ex officio. The first of the above remarks seems to me to show that Thomas Brown's position was ad hoc, created not for an office which he filled at the moment, but for him. Taking this view, I should be disposed to accept the non in the second passage, though even without it, the remark does not, I think, establish conclusively the officiality of the archdeacon's position at the board ex novella constitutione is elsewhere applied to thomas brown and is there explained as meaning 
added by the present king. At this point I come, with great diffidence, into conflict with the view which sees in these two the ancestors of the remembrancers, officials, be it noted, who are not known to occur under that name before the reign of Henry the Third. The identification of the archdeacon and the lord treasurer's remembrancer may here be left. It is a matter largely of taste, for it depends almost entirely upon the interpretation put upon the passage quoted above, though there is possibly some force in the fact that the archdeacon is connected with the function of summons, together with the fact that if Thomas Brown is the ancestor of the king's remembrancer, there seems really no reason why the archdeacon should not foreshadow the lord treasurer's remembrancer. If Thomas Brown's suggested position be not substantiated, then the similar suggestion for his contemporary rather falls to the ground. Now as to Thomas Brown. Dr. Poole's argument is that the words quoad or portet, excipiat, applied to his clerk, imply a selection of topics, and that the regni iura, regis qui secreta, contained in his role are very nearly what the later remembrancers wrote in their roles. In making this point, Dr. Poole has to dismiss the statements that any errors made in excipiendo can easily be corrected by a comparison with the chancellors and the pipe rolls, together with an important comment of Discipolis in this connection. This is difficult, and an even greater difficulty is that the same word, excipere, is applied to the work done by the chancellor's clerk, who undoubtedly makes an exact copy from the work done by the treasurer's clerk. As to the word secreta, Dr. Poole has already explained its use in connection with Thomas Brown's Sicilian experiences as referring to the Duana de Secretis, and there seems to be no difficulty here in explaining it either, as Professor Haskins does, as a piece of mere magniloquence, or as being borrowed by the writer of the Dialogus from his own previous description. The man who was great in the Secreta of Sicily was also great in our English Secreta, a piece of elusiveness quite in character. Of course, it may be argued that Brown did keep an exact copy, but that, in spite of this, he was a remembrancer. I confess I find it quite easy to suppose that a restless experimenter, to adopt Professor Haskins' description of Henry the Second, temporarily included special members in his court of exchequer in order to have the advantage of their advice and in consideration of their financial experience, which was well known. Elsewhere I have tried to show that so early as the beginning of this king's reign new revenue problems were making the conduct of the audit upon the old lines by no means a simple matter. It is much more difficult, I think, to suppose a permanent change to have been made by revolutionary innovation at the exchequer, whereas, as the dialogus shows, the ancient course was already a shibboleth. Such changes are extremely rare in the whole of exchequer history and indeed in the whole of English administrative history, it is much easier to suppose that the remembrances were merely the evolution into a separate name and recognized office of the simple clerks of one of the original officers of the court, just as was the case with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, originally the Chancellor's clerk, and the Clerk of the Pipe, Treasurer's clerk, at the Upper Exchequer, the Clerk of the Pells, Treasurer's clerk, at the Receipt, and other distinct officials in other courts. This is perhaps again very much a matter of taste, but there are other arguments less open to that objection. The nature of the later memoranda rolls does not suggest that they originated in copies from the pipe rolls. They consist, in fact, largely of things which are not in the pipe roll. Again, neither of the later remembrancers had any function at the receipt. Thomas Brown kept a clerk there. Final and strongest argument against this derivation of the remembrancers office, the dialogus actually mentions the making of memoranda, and memoranda of such a nature as we should expect. Very little, it says, is written at the Easter Scircarium. Tamen quedam memoranda quae frequenter incident, siursum tuc scribuntur, ut soluto scario, de highest discernant, maiores quae quidam non facile propter numerosum sui multitudium, Nisi scripto commendarenter, occurrent. The volume of business is so increased that many matters, so many that they must be noted in writing, have to be reserved for discussion, so to speak, out of term. We shall have to return to this later. For the moment, the interesting point is that this writing is done, 
a clerico thesaurii. In treating, therefore, this section of records, it is from the view of the memoranda that we must start, that is, from an expectation of finding in the pipe roll such a growing unwieldiness and confusion as would necessitate the regular making not of extracts from it, but of notes of preliminary and interim matters which need not ultimately appear in the pipe roll at all, and from the parallel expectation of what, when we find them, the first memoranda will be. So we may turn, after a rather long digression, to the actual records of John. End of section 15